Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, June 11th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, politicians want to pass the trade deal to see what's in it. Then, the truth about geoengineering and the polite police of Bilderberg perform a midnight raid on a journalist. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. And tell them Hell Cobra. They've, uh, they're not going to say Hell Cobra. <laughs> Hell Cobra. Our first story tonight, I think, is a perfect illustration of the interaction between the TPP and the Bilderberg elite, but you can see it already in operation here in the American government. And that's a story about Obama cracking down on airplane emissions at the same time He's buying a massive new Air Force One. Now, this is a Breitbart story. They point out that the EPA will now hold hearings on the prospective findings and then write up legislation. No, I'm sorry, they said regulation, didn't they? What's the difference? Well, the difference is you never voted for the director of the EPA. You didn't vote for the FCC commissioner or the FDA commissioner or the IRS commissioner, did you? Nevertheless, these agencies persist eternally without ever being elected by us, and they are the ones who are writing the law. That's what will happen if the transatlantic and transpacific partnerships come through. Now, they go on to say these regulations will reportedly align with regulations that the International Civil Aviation Organization, an agency of the UN, is developing. You see how that trickles down? It's created by the United Nations. Then it's enforced by not our, even our legislature. It's enforced by a bureaucracy. Now, Senator Sessions has already pointed out that if this is passed in these trade agreements, in the TPP, and the TTIP, the Transatlantic, the Trans-Pacific Agreements, in those agreements are commissions that are essentially transnational governing units. This is going to be a political union as well as an economic union, and these will be living agreements. They will be modified continuously without any input from the legislature, just as we see happening here with regulations from the EPA as they assert authority over all water or, and tell us that we can't have uh, uh, fires in our fireplaces. They're gonna crack down on barbecue pits. This is what's going to happen with these massive trade agreements if they go through. Now they go on to talk about what's really happening on the flip side of this. Because see, as they're shutting down everything for you and I, they will give themselves exemptions for these things that are supposedly so evil. They, on the other hand, will engage in them, and not only engage in them, but indulge in them. Look at this description of this plane, the new Air Force One. This is a $367 million Boeing 747-8. It runs 4,786 square feet inside of it. That's bigger than most of your homes. They call it a palace in the sky, according to Business Insider. It's the longest airliner ever. The interior is glossy and gorgeous. They say it has leather couches, big screen televisions, top of the line side tables, a state room that would make the MGM grand envious, a huge office, a conference room, two galleys capable of feeding 100 people, and it burns five gallons of jet fuel for every mile flown. That's 21 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions per gallon. Now, that is what they will do. They will indulge in all these things that they tell us are so harmful that they have to be cut down for us. Because you understand that when they enact these regulations for domestic airplanes here in the United States, it's going to be even more expensive to fly uh, within the United States. Of course, I don't know why any of us would choose to do that unless we have to do it for business because of what they've done with the security state. Nevertheless, it highlights what is going on between the elites and the set of rules that they follow and the rules that they will impose on the rest of us to impoverish us, to control us. Now, the Europeans are not having any of this. Nigel Farage and the UKIP uh, party in the in Parliament, European Parliament yesterday brought the TTIP to a halt. In this article from The Independent, they say Nigel Farage marches to the front of the Parliament in a protest against a last-minute vote to suspend debate on a controversial free trade agreement. That is the TTIP, the Transatlantic Partnership. They say that um, Stephen Wolf, UKIP's immigration and financial affairs spokesman, initiated the protest by reading out rules of procedure stating that if 40 MEPs members of the European Parliament, stood up, they could halt the entire plenary session. 
Please stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. No, 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 no. La seduta era stata sospesa, ma non... I had already suspended the sitting. It's not possible because we don't have anything on the agenda. The sitting is, the session is suspended. Now, as you can see in that footage, the uh, chair of the uh, parliament said, uh, no, 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 you can't halt it. I've already closed it. There's no business to discuss. And Nigel Farage, as you also saw, went up to the front and had a heated discussion. I can only imagine what happened there. Because, you know, we've seen the footage of Nigel Farage confronting the former uh, European Parliament president, Herman von Rompuy, saying that he had the demeanor of a low-grade bank clerk. Well, somebody with the demeanor of a low-level bagman, John Boehner, is not only not opposing this unconstitutional power grab, he is trying to expedite it. He's saying that it looks like we're going to have the vote tomorrow, on Friday, perhaps that early. They'll probably do it on the weekend, just as the Senate passed it through on the weekend. They always do the dirty work when it's a weekend, a holiday weekend, or when nobody is paying attention. From Politico, they say the GOP is bullish on the trade vote. And the interesting thing about this article is that in the last day, they have changed the subtitle. The subtitle now says the vote to grant Obama fast-tracked authority to negotiate a massive trade deal will be extremely tight on all accounts. That's not what they had a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago, when this first went up, they were talking about how the snag to keep this from happening was negotiations on welfare benefits for the people who were going to lose their jobs. That's still in the article, but it is not the subtitle. But that is the real subtitle as to what's going on. And of course, what's happening in this country is the same kind of parliamentary shenanigans that you just saw happen in the European Parliament. They were within their rights to stop the entire plenary session. They completely ignore, ignored the rules, and that's what is happening here. It is a trade treaty. It is not an agreement. It is not a partnership. It is a treaty. It is an economic agreement between one or more nations, just as if it were a peace agreement, those are called treaties. They require 67 votes in the Senate. They're taking that away. It will only require 51 votes in the Senate. Now they're saying, we're going to vote on it in the House as well. So don't you feel better that they are changing the Constitution without amending it? I don't feel better. And quite frankly, it was done that way because the Senate has the power to do a filibuster. Individual members can do a filibuster to stop a treaty. They want to make it difficult for these things to happen. Not easy. They're ignoring the Constitution, and they're going to shut down filibusters. They're going to shut down the typical way that a bill makes its way through the uh, Senate, through the House, going through committee, being recommended by the leadership. No, they will demand that these new treaties will come to the floor in no less than 45 days. They will have no more than 20 hours to debate it, but they will not be able to amend it. And as I pointed out, once this is passed, it can be amended and will be amended, just as we see regulations being constantly written by the EPA and other uh, bureaucracies here in the United States. Now, although our elected representatives are not standing up to this, and we don't see the kind of outrage in America that we see in Europe, the, most of the public here in America doesn't even know what this is about. They don't even know what the TPP stands for. They don't even know. They've not even heard of it. Still, we have some people who are pushing back against the global agenda. We have farmers who are now starting to ditch GMO soybeans, and they're doing it because of economic interest. But of course, this is something that is going to be a part of these trade agreements. And understand, too, that it's not just the TPP, the TTIP. There's already been two more agreements that we've learned about in the two weeks since the Senate ran this through and uh, came up with a fast-tracked authority that hasn't quite passed the House yet. There are going to be multiple trade agreements that Obama can bring through, that the next president can bring through, because it's going to last for six years if it passes the House. So you need to call these people up, tell them that you're aware of it, tell them that you're watching it, just as the people in Europe have done, and it has backed this off, at least for the time being. But here in America, we've got some farmers who are acting out of their own economic interest that are ditching GMO soybeans. As Christina Sarich of InfoWars.com points out, if Roundup Ready variety of soybeans cost $65 to $70 a bag, but conventional non-GMO varieties are only $30 to $35 a bag, in other words, half the price, 
She says, you would think that farmers would go with the non-GMO stuff. It costs half the price and they can sell it at a premium because people are concerned about the health implications, not only of GMO, but also of pesticides and inorganic fertilizers. Now the University of Arkansas is planting nine non-GMO soybeans on test plots. Four of those strains were developed by the university. And she says, and here's why. Of course, we're told that uh, they have to have the Roundup Ready GMO because uh, that's going to keep the weeds down. Nevertheless, there are other weeds that it doesn't work on. And we see that the weeds themselves are modifying themselves in the old-fashioned way. Not in the laboratory, but just with selective breeding to become resistant to Roundup. She points out round, the resistance issue has really changed people's mindset in the agricultural uh, business. There are seven glyphosate-resistant weeds now and other weeds that are resistant to other herbicides. That is always going to be the case. You're always going to have natural adaptations. The concern is that with monopolized food supply, if you have one strain of genetically modified uh, variety, that strain could be lost and we could face a famine. Not just the fact that these corporations would own everything. And of course, that's the underlying motivation behind these trade agreements. Now, moving on to Bilderberg, of course, our reporters are there, and the mainstream media is starting to talk about it a little bit. Here's a story from Yahoo. Never mind the G7 or Davos, it's Bilderberg time. Now, it looks like that might be, they might be understanding what's really going on here, but not really. Here's a quote from Yahoo. They say, critics deplore the fact that unlike last weekend's Group of Seven meeting in nearby Bavaria, no press are allowed at Bilderberg giving rise to accusations of secrecy and suspicions of dishonest goings-on. But organizers say that since the gathering in Telfs Buchen last year was in Denmark, they say, is away from prying eyes, it allows those attending to talk freely about hot-button issues of the day. Yeah, move along. There's nothing to see. Just the most powerful people on earth telling you that you can't talk to them, that you can't cover even who is there. Of course, they'll give us their official list, but we can't see who's going and coming there. Now, what kind of important issues would they be talking about? Well, of course, one of those is what's going on in the European Union itself. Greece is trying to, they're trying to come up with something for this Greek tra tragedy. And as the AP points out, Greece is getting a wake-up call next week could seal its fate. Do you think they might be talking about that with some of the largest, the heads of the largest banks throughout the world, as well as the politicians there? They say the clear message that came out Swiftly tone down your demands in the bailout talks over the next week or face financial ruin. Yeah, these guys are playing hardball, these bankers who are there. And of course, one of the bankers who's there is Mario Monti. Remember him? Goldman Sachs. He was appointed to be the technocrat in charge of Italy when they were in financial straits. Evidently, the Greeks are not willing to take some Goldman Sachs banker and give him the hands to their the reins to their government. So it looks like they're going to play pretty hardball with him. They say the IMF took the toughest stance, saying that it was bringing its negotiations back to Washington as there had been no sign of compromise. In other words, we haven't, you haven't given us what we want, so we're going to take our ball back to Washington. That's some of the types of things that are going to be discussed there at Bilderberg. But, uh, of course, Charlie Skelton, who is there along with our reporters, and he's from The Guardian, he was uh, on the air today with Alex Jones talking about what happened to him. He had a very interesting perspective because he was at the G7. And he said this in today's uh, article at The Guardian. He says, at the G7, we journalists were pampered, but at Bilderberg, we're harassed by the police. He said, Bilderberg uses the same security as G7, just on a slightly different Alp, slightly different mountain. So why don't the lavish state resources extend to allowing free press reporting? And then he gives a personal uh, recount of what happened. He says, back at the G7 summit, barely a day and 20 miles from here, I was treated like a prince. I was one of the chosen 3,000 journalists who were primped, pampered, fed, burped, given free t-shirts, gallons of goulash, buckets of booze, and all the cheesy footage of world leaders we could swallow. We lay back on our branded bean bags and were tickled silly by the gentle fist of the G7 PR machine. But not anymore. The bean bag has burst. And then he quotes these German uh, police, these Austrian police who come out, step out of the vehicle, show me identification papers. A group of Austrian police officers took up position around my car. I pulled on the handbrake, opened the door, and I swear one young officer shifted his hand to the butt of his sidearm like I was about to rush them, all 12 of them, all of them armed. And of course, that's exactly what uh, Josh Owens told us as well. When they got pulled over, the guys are putting their hand on their gun as if they're ready to pull it out and shoot them. 
Uh, we have an article up uh, about an interview that they conducted with him there in Austria, as well as the interview that was uh, today on the Alex Jones Show. Guardian journalist set, gets midnight raid by Bilderberg police. It didn't stop just with this checkpoint. And, of course, what he's talking about uh, in the article and what he talked about in the interviews with us was the fact that he got a midnight visit from the police. They came into his apartment, hung around for 15 minutes. He got tired of them hanging. Maybe he thought if he uh, took off uh, his clothes and took a shower, they would leave. Uh, they didn't. They waited. So I guess they were there for about a half hour or so. They're still there. They told him, get dressed when he gets out of the shower. Get dressed. We're going to take you out to your car again. And they inspected his car yet again. Nothing but harassment. So I ask you, what does this tell us about the two uh, different groups? Does it tell us perhaps that at the G7, we've got a lot of essentially powerless figureheads who are doing precisely as they were told. People like John Boehner, bagmen, frontmen, vassals of the multinational corporations that are writing the laws and telling them what to do with these transatlantic, transpacific partnerships with all of these trade agreements. They're the ones who are really, truly in power. The people who are writing these trade agreements are now meeting secretly in Bilderberg. We're not even allowed to know who is in attendance. And of course, they have their own rules. They have their, they call it the Chatham House rules. They don't play by our rules. They create their own separate rules. And they get our elected representatives like John Boehner, like Mitch McConnell, to ignore the Constitution, to ignore the legislative process, pretend it doesn't exist, invent a new one, so that they can force these trade agreements upon us. That's what's really going on. And when you look at the fact that they want nothing to come out of this meeting, that they come down with an iron fist on everyone who is theirs. We've had other reports about how they're jamming cell phone signals, uh, perhaps eavesdropping on cell phones there, this massive security cordon there. That tells you that you are truly at the center of power there and not at that fake PR event that they call the G7. Now, we're going to be right back after the break. We're going to uh, talk more about these partnerships and essentially about this trade promotion authority that will be coming up for the final vote to make it effective, let's say, perhaps tomorrow, but certainly this weekend. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Now, as I reported at the beginning of the news, they're hoping to have a vote this weekend in the House on the fast-tracked authority. Once that's put through, They'll be able to ram through, and now the current tally is four different trade agreements that they've got ready to run through this. And, of course, they can do this for six years once they get the authority without any further input, really, from Congress. No amendments, just rubber stamp process. If you want to know what's in the TPP, though, in this short amount of time, you need to go to readthetpp.com. Now, oh, yeah, if you click on that, the problem is, as you see, as you click on that button, it just keeps moving around. And it comes up and says, we're just kidding. You can't read the TPP. That's right, because it's a secret agreement. You know, even though we've got, in, in Europe, they have massive demonstrations, thousands of people opposing the TTIP, the Transatlantic Partnership there. We saw in the UKIP, as we reported in the last segment, we had Nigel Farage talking about uh, trying to stop this and talking about how they have had more people contact him with calls, with letters, than on any other subject ever. Nevertheless, here in America, where we are kind of at the nexus of this, we're the center. We're signing an agreement not only with Europe, but also with the Asian countries as well. We're the linchpin, perhaps because we have the most apathetic, most ill-informed public. Show them readthetpp.com. That might get them curious as to what's going on with this, because we're not going to get any information from our elected representatives. Look at this story. Look at what Paul Ryan is saying. Of course, the guy who might have been vice president if Romney had run, the man who is nearly the Republican vice president, said he's, it's declassified and made public once it's agreed to. And see that picture there of him with Nancy Pelosi? Because, of course, she famously said with Obamacare, we have to pass it so you can find out what's in it. Everybody laughed about that. But, of course, now she and the Democrats are calling on the Republicans, tell us what's in this bill. You should be telling us what's in this bill. You should be uh, open and transparent about it. That's a false game they play between the two of them, the loyal opposition. And you know who they're loyal to? It's not to the American public. It's not to the Constitution. It's to the multinational corporations who have written this secret agreement and want people like Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi to run this thing through, and then they'll tell you what's in it. You notice that he says it's declassified? 
It's declassified. So in other words, right now it is classified. It'll be declassified once they pass it, but right now it's classified. It's very interesting, and it's something that we really haven't talked about here at InfoWars very much, but there's been a lot of legislation lately about trade secrets, massive penalties enacted for trade secrets. Of course, that will be in the new agreements. You can guarantee that once uh, they pass the transatlantic, transpacific agreements, these other treaties, that'll be a big part of it. But trade secrets are now as important as top secrets because our corporations are being elevated to and above the level of government. That's precisely what's going on. The man who could have been vice president, the Eddie Munster, you know, they say that they're the stakeholders. Uh, today we had the, uh, the death of Christopher Lee, who for many years played Count Dracula. They're going to wind up uh, playing stakeholders if they keep doing this. These vampires are going to have some stakes in their heart. But, of course, we've seen this all before. We've seen that uh, John Boehner has been the, the uh, bag man for Big Tobacco, famously giving out checks on the floor of the House back in the 90s just before a vote on an issue that was very important to Big Tobacco. So we have to ask, who is bankrolling this right now? Who's getting paid off? I and mean, we have an article up on Infowars.com. Big Pharma is revealed as the puppet master behind TPP secrecy. This is from Zero Hedge. They say, it is no secret that U.S. US healthcare corporations have been among, if not the biggest beneficiaries of Obamacare by socializing costs. Of course, they can compel you to purchase their product, something that you didn't want or need. You weren't buying it voluntarily or you couldn't afford it. They can force you to buy it at the price that they want to sell it to you at. Now, we also see that big pharmaceuticals have initiatives all across the United States right now to force you to inject their vaccines, even though they have legal immunity from anything that might happen. You can't sue them if their products damage you. And understand that as they push these uh, legislative bills through to remove your informed consent, that this is going to be not only for the massive number of vaccines that we have now, but for all the vaccines that they will be developing in the future. And they have every incentive to make every kind of treatment that they come up with be called a vaccine. They don't have that kind of legal immunity if it's an antibiotic. They don't have it for drugs, but they have it for vaccines. So you can imagine that they're going to create a vaccine, whether it's safe, whether it's effective, they're going to be putting it out there and forcing you to take it on their schedule if we don't stop these kind of initiatives throughout the states. That's why they're pushing through these massive trade deals, because they don't want to have to fight these battles like they have GMO labeling on a state-by-state -state level. They don't even want to fight it at the national level. They want to get it done once. They want to move the authority to a transnational governing body that they can control, and then they won't have to even bother at the national level. He goes on to point out that uh, as far as Big Pharma's involvement in these trade agreements, he says, when it came to the highly confidential TPP, it was unclear just which corporations were dominant in pulling the strings. He said, now, thanks to documents that have been published by WikiLeaks and analyzed by the New York Times, it appears that Big Pharma is once again pulling the strings. This time of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which if passed, will empower big pharmaceutical firms to command higher reimbursement rates in the U.S. and abroad at the expense of consumers. Now, of course, one of the ways that's going to work is they're going to extend the amount of time that they keep their patents for medicine, keeping them out of the generic drug market. Other countries have much shorter time periods than we do here in the United States. So they can extend their copyright length. Understand, that's the same game that Hollywood and the music companies have been playing for quite some time. The goal, the end goal, is for them to have ownership of everything forever. When the IMF did it, it was called rent-seeking, when they went in and debted developing nations to them perpetually, putting them under such a burden of debt that they could never get out. They want to make sure that you will pay them rent for everything, that nothing ever goes into the public domain, whether it's a drug, whether it's a tune, whether it's a movie. They will hold that over your head, and then they will use that to further restrict our freedoms on the Internet as well. Now, one last area here of the TPP. This is an article from Observer.com, and they point out that leading the way among TPP nations seeking to sway American policy is Japan, which signed up former Democrat leader Tom Daschle's firm, as well as well-connected public relations firm DCI. Ka-ching! There you go. That's how these guys cash in. Tom Daschle, former House leader, Democrat, he becomes a lobbyist, and he's working to push this thing through, as many others are. Of course, we had Dennis Hastert, 
Also became a lobbyist, made millions of dollars so much that he could afford to pay off a blackmailer easily. We are seeing the breakdown, the corruption in our government, and we ask, well, how can we get these corrupt animals out? Well, no, we'll just defeat them in the next election. Really? Well, you know, they got to the ballot box before you did, and they're stuffing it, and they're controlling it. Stay with us right after the break. Leanne McAdoo talks to a local candidate. She is alleging voter fraud here that looks very much like what we're seeing across the nation. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me in studio now is Dr. Laura Presley, PhD. She is a two-time candidate for Austin City Council, and we've watched her campaign closely because we really uh, were in support of this candidacy that sort of rose out of activism. You've been very outspoken about making Austin a fluoride-free city, as well as educating people on the dangers of smart meters and things like that. So it would have been really nice to actually have someone there on the city council with a scientific background. Now, Laura, you're not a career politician, but you ran a really strong race, and I don't think a lot of people were expecting you to have such a massive support there in the district that you were running. Um, now, we actually went to a runoff here in Austin, and through that process, you might have uncovered a huge issue with the electronic voter machines, not just here in Austin, but actually statewide. So talk to us a little bit about what you discovered. Well, we, we had some issues with our election, and we don't know what happened, but we know that the numbers just don't add up. One of the things, you know, we noticed um, on election night, we had electioneers at every single precinct that voted in my district in the city council. And report, reports were coming back that we were doing great. Every precinct was showing you're over 60 percent. You look really good. You've got this in the bag. And then election night, we get the results, Leanne. And, you know, my opponent is declared the victor at two to one. And that was just not consistent with the reports we were getting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my background is a semiconductor industry here in Austin. And I spent a lot of time in the 17 years in that industry analyzing data and looking at numbers and looking at, at software issues. And so we went back the next morning and looked at the numbers. We found a lot of issues. There were more ballots then there were voters' names for early voting that mm -hmm. Travis County had reported to us as a campaign. There were many people who had cast their ballot by mail, and their names showed up multiple times on voting on different days. And wow. several of those voters I knew, one was a woman, she was in a wheelchair, and I know she didn't vote three times. So that was really a big a flag for us. And so I also started looking at the data. We looked at our November election, which was a general election with about eight candidates in it. And then we had a, a runoff in December with two candidates, myself and my opponent. And we noticed some repetitive mathematical patterns in the data. The relative percents that I received in the top precincts in my district, we got 35.1% back in the November election. And then in the December runoff, we got exactly the same percent again. This is absolutely not making sense mm -hmm. because not only were there six weeks between the two elections, 4,000 voters attrited out. And so to remain the same just doesn't make sense. We had also three precincts where exactly the same results um, from the November to the general election in December stayed the same. That is not credible either. So mm -hmm. we, we said something's wrong. You know, what's going on? Are there, are there, you know, electronic results that maybe weren't erased that were maybe used again in the December elections, just some, some mistake, or was there you know, some other type of more serious issue? So what we looked at, we had a statistician look at our data, and he asked us to plot on the x-axis and the y-axis the November election versus the, the December election. And we did that for multiple candidates and myself, and you can see other candidates have these kind of blobs, these scatter plots, where our election was exactly a straight line that is highly unusual and not expected. So right, again, data looks it looks a little problematic. It looks, there. And people who like math like I do, you know, <laughs> look at this and go, oh, there's no way. Yeah. This is a big, big problem. So we, what did we do about it? We said, let's do a recount. We think there's an issue. Maybe some errors occurred. Let's do a recount. And interestingly, in the Texas statutes, you can do a manual recount of ballot images for electronic voting. So we did that. So we went to Travis County, we did the recount, 
And one thing we found in that recount, the ballot by mail results were very different than the electronic results. The ballot by mail showed exactly a tie 50 to 50. Those are the only paper ballots that remain in our election. And so the electronic results were the two to one, okay, 33% and 33%. So we said there's a problem there. One thing that Travis County couldn't produce were the actual ballot images. That's what the state law says is for these electronic voting systems, they wanted two pathways. They wanted a data pathway and they wanted a ballot image verification of this. And apparently Travis County has never been able to keep these ballot images, which is a problem across the state. Wow. We're not the only election that has found this. We're the first ones to file an election contest, a, a court case over this, that the, that the Travis County and also the Secretary of State is not adhering to the state law. Right. And so that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's not just Austin statewide. And I'm sure we're yes. seeing this nationally as well. Uh, so much evidence of vote flipping people actually taking their phones into the booth and, and taking pictures a video of the votes actually flipping and things like that, where we're seeing this again and again with this el electronic voting, it has the, the opportunity there for some malfeasance. That's right. And, you know, my background is software and in the semiconductor industry, and this is not hard to do. And so I think, you know, what I'm really was impressed with was the legislature. The Texas legislature had a strategy to deal with this. They wanted a data structure, which is kind of um, very simple to manipulate and tamper with, but they wanted a backup, which is this ballot image statute that's on the books. That came into play in 97, 1997. And so apparently the Secretary of State and these counties in Texas have not been adhering to this. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know. You know, we walked in, we expected them to follow the law, mm -hmm. and that's not what occurred. So we filed a contest, an election contest, and we presented our evidence. The judge let us get some discovery from the county, and we got some really interesting data out of the Travis County voting system. And one of the things we got where we found where there were systematic corrupt mobile ballot box errors that were occurring on election night when the votes were being entered and tabulated. This is, this is a big issue. So it wasn't, I mean, you were seeing it sort of systematically. So it wasn't as if one station was just, someone made a mistake here or there. No, it was, it was occurring at the very beginning before votes were being added into, mm -hmm. into the system. You know, you had this corruption error and votes were being added. You had a corruption error the votes were being added, and this occurred nine different times throughout election night. Wow. That is a problem. What was yeah. going on? What causes corruption? Was it one, one electronic mobile ballot box that, that had a corruption, or was it nine of them? Right. Was it being used repetitive? So we asked the judge, can we please get to the software and look at why this thing was corrupted? The judge told us, no, we couldn't get to it. And we also said, well, can we interview, can we take the deposition of the county employee that was entering this? No, you cannot go get the deposition of the person who was using this. That's not good because, you know, right. we needed that evidence. Yeah. So we went to court and we had a hearing and the judge threw our case out because we had no evidence where, you know, he wasn't, wasn't allowing us to get you know, a little deeper into yeah, finding and you out what actually, happened. I mean, aside just from these plot points and everything, you also have printouts that the city gave you, probably not thinking that you would even understand what you were looking at there. It just looks like a bunch of numbers, but you're actually able to tabulate there where you could see that software was malfunctioning at a certain point in time. That's right. Nine different stations. That's um, right. And the New York Times actually reported that this was one of the big issues with e-voting, is that software could be used to corrupt the votes. And I mean, that's New York Times right there. So this isn't as if, you know, some, you know, conspiracy theory that you're thinking perhaps someone may have corrupted the software. It's a, it's a legit question. It's a legit It is. Concern. It's a very, very good question. And, you know, we, we got really close and we wanted to see what was causing this, this mobile ballot box. What these mobile ballot boxes are, they are memory cards that are used at each of the polling locations where all the votes are stored. Mm -hmm. So when that's corrupted, that's a big, that, that throws up another flag. That's a big issue. And then, and then there's a third, a third kind of backup set of data that is used, election record that is used for elections. When you go vote, you'll have election judges at your polling location. 
And after the polls close, election judges are instructed by the Secretary of State of Texas to print what they call backup tapes, results tally tapes. So those results tapes have candidates' names and the number of votes that they received at that location, and they're to put, they're to take those and put those in envelopes. Judges sign them, take them home in case there's, you know, a fire or some disaster that occurs. These are very important election record tapes. Those backup tapes were the judges were instructed to not print those. Wow. And we have it was got, actually written on It was actually written on the judges' envelopes. Do not print. Yeah. And that's a, a this is, constitutional <laughs> <laughs> This is, you know, this is required. The the election judges are supposed to print the tally tapes. It's the third record, the third backup in case you don't have ballot images, in case, you know, the memory cards are corrupted, you go to these tally tapes and they don't exist. They were right. instructed not to print them. And so here we have a bunch of issues, a bunch of irregularities, more ballots than we have names. We have, you know, mathematical patterns. We've got corrupt electronic memory cards. We have election records that are missing, and the judge threw our case out. And so that's, you know, we're, we're, we are considering an appeal. And he did make some, the judge did make some good comments during the hearing. And, um, you know, he said, we're going to do this as a no evidence summary judgment, which will make it clean for an appeal. So we're in the process of making that decision. It's expensive. And so we're asking yeah. for help from, you know, all across the state of Texas. This is affecting all of us. We have, we've had candidates call us in Tarrant County, Harris County, and Dallas County and say they've asked about these ballot images. Mm -hmm. No one will print them. They can't print them. And we're the first candidate to bring this. This is a case of first impression across the state. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so unprecedented. So what do you want to say to people who are just, you know, say you're being a sore loser and to just get oh, over it? Well, you know, and our elections are the most important thing that we do um, in this, in this, in our country. And if we don't do this right, we don't hold our election officers accountable, we get the elections and, and people representing us who we deserve. Because we're here, we have to hold people accountable and make sure they do it right. That the people's people are the ones up there representing us. It is, there's nothing more important. And you think about this, elections have to be um, verifiable and accurate. And if they're not, that's the root cause of a lot of problems. You know, your taxes, your laws, your police, all of these things are really dictated by the people that we represent, that we vote for mm -hmm. and want as representatives. You know, and there's one more thing I think that's interesting about our race. These, um, and I want to show this, I don't think we did. Let's show the ballot image the ballot and the cast vote record that the county is is saying is a ballot. When we did a we did our recount, what the county the county said we could they could not produce these ballot images, right? These concurrent these ballot images. So what they did produce was what they call a cast vote record, which is basically a template. It's a printout to a template. It's a printout from the data structure file that they have to a template. So whatever they counted on election night, they're printing to a single piece of paper one by one which is not a ballot image, okay? So the cast vote record, if we'll show it one more time, you can see on there, it's a little bit, a little bit small, but this cast vote record is not a official ballot. And in Texas, you count and you run elections by official ballot. So it doesn't have the date of the election on it. It doesn't have the name of the election. It doesn't have instructions. It doesn't have the voting squares, what a normal ballot looks like, which is on the left there. And, and most importantly, the sequential serial number. Yes, ma'am. That is exactly <laughs> right. So the Texas Constitution requires that there's a sequential serial number on every ballot so that we just, we just don't vote on any old piece of paper, right. right? We vote on an official ballot. That's missing. So these cast vote records that the county produced for us to count are not ballots. And so mm -hmm. that's the really crux of our lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Holding the, the, the county... Um, to the state law and asking the Secretary of State to hold all counties across the state to the state law. And um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this it's is a, a big it's, deal. Yeah, it's not about winning that seat. This is much bigger than that. It's about transparency. Right. You can't have democracy without transparency. So tell the audience uh, where they can go to help support you in, in this. Well, thank you. Thank you for having us on here yeah. and talking about this really, really critical issue. So we're, we're considering filing an appeal. No candidate in the state of Texas has ever filed an appeal based on tabulation errors of electronic voting machines and that the state required documents and records of the election were not retained. These ballot images and also these results tapes were not preserved. And so that's our case. And uh, we're considering an appeal. And it's an expensive endeavor to, to
to do the right thing, and we're asking for uh, everyone to please help with a donation and, and to, our, to our lawsuit. And you can look at us and check our, all our documents out at PresleyForAustin.com, and that's our uh, website. And so any donation of any size, $25 to $5,000, we are, uh, no amount is too small or too large. So thank you. Much appreciated. Well, thank yeah. you so much for sharing your story. Hopefully we can, something will come of this because we've got a, you know, another big election year coming up. And That's right. it seems like every year people are bringing forward proof of, of some wrongdoings or mistakes or actual malfeasance with these e-voting machines. And every year they're kind of, you know, judges are signing off on it saying there's no evidence and look away and stop being a sore loser, things like that. And this is huge. You're absolutely right. The voting is one of the most important things that we do as a free absolute. society, and especially in our local elections where our votes really count. Uh, so thank you That's so right. much. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, the we time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, stick around because after the break, a very special report from Alex Jones. And finally tonight here at InfoWars Nightly News, I want to give you the story behind the story. Or as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. There's an uh, article from Breitbart. And there's a lot of other publications breaking this down and going over to today that President Obama is moving ahead with a push for basically carbon tax emissions on aircraft in this country. Now, we already have emission rules, but they want to basically regulate carbon dioxide that is put off and by declaring that a toxic waste, they're able to tax it and able to shrink the size of engines. In fact, they're in the news now talking about commercial and also private aviation, the aircraft getting slower, things going in reverse because we have to cut our carbon by 20% just in the next few years and then by 50% in the next decade. We're talking about crippling industrial civilization and not having anything to replace it. But don't worry, government aircraft will be exempt from this, and President Obama has ordered the most massive new Air Force One in history, the biggest and the longest, and he personally just made that decision. Now, what's the rest of the story here? Well, everyone knows that for decades, insiders blew the whistle about NSA spying and bulk data collection. And the media spun it and said no such thing is happening. We also, for decades, uh, heard that so many other government programs weren't taking place, and then later it would come out that they were taking place. There are countless examples of government and media working together to keep us in the dark. Until the early 1950s, we were told that there was no such thing as organized crime in this country. Everyone now knows that, of course, it was always going on, and not just Italian, but across the board. Everything from German to Irish to Jewish to Filipino, it's been going on. It's been happening. But this is part of the childlike state that they have tried to basically keep the population in for so long. Whether it's on the Patriot Act being used against citizens or illegal NSA spying. But the rest of the story here is weather modification. It has been well known since the 70s that Western governments, but also the Russians, could manipulate hurricanes, typhoons, could actually start hurricanes and typhoons. During Vietnam, Ben Livingston, the father of weather weapons, led squadrons in that would flood the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He could take a clear blue sky and turn it into huge thunderheads that would dump two feet of water in just a few hours. My name is Ben Livingston. I'm the first person to ever see the cloud with the intention to cause it to do military damage. I know I can say that, and I did it several times before the next person did it. Tell me what these clouds are we're looking at. Well, <clears throat> this, uh, these clouds were located up in the uh, southern part of North Vietnam, and we needed to make rain down on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, <clears throat> Highway 1. But there weren't any real clouds around. There were a number. This was the end of the monsoon season, but there were a number of these small clouds uh, that reached, barely reached the, reached the uh, freezing level, and by putting a small amount of, of uh, silver iodide in there, we got them to collect 
and start to build. And as they built, we just worked on the, the largest tower in the group until in very, just a very short time we and had the clouds that were... You told me ready. this cloud got 14 inches of... of, of well, this cloud, of course, this is all the same cloud. In 1978, they had the Environmental Modification Convention outlawing the weaponization of these weather control systems. But again, you ask the average American about it, they don't know about it because, well, the media either ridicules it or doesn't cover it. Now, occasionally they do tell the truth. Here's ABC News, weather engineering in China. And it just goes into them clearing the skies uh, for the 2008 Olympics. So those are just some of the examples. Uh, we also have NASA coming out a decade ago and then again last year and saying the Earth is between 20 and 30% more darker in the Northern Hemisphere than it was just a few decades ago. And that's not because the sun has really changed. It's because, as satellite images show, the condensation trails from jet aircraft are so numerous that they're blocking out the sun. But they're not just ice crystals. Some of them are real condensation trails. Others have had aluminum dioxide, barium salts, and even radioactive isotopes added. We have the U.S. Patent Office documents on this. A globalist won a Nobel Prize back in the early 90s for coming up with the idea of a sunscreen to protect the Earth from the sun. The truth is, it's a giant secret global program that's partially declassified and going on on a mass scale. So they're trying to restrict engine size and slow down jet aircraft and make us go backwards to, quote, save us from carbon dioxide that plants breathe and then put off oxygen from, while ignoring the fact that they're spraying the skies with aluminum that's deadly for plants, animals, you name it, not to mention all the other chemicals. And what's crazy is... They have national media come out and say, I'm a conspiracy theory that, 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 that we're engaged in made-up garbage when we're covering real stuff that's been happening, real things that are unfolding. It's just like the Manhattan Project. In today's numbers, it cost 4 or $5 trillion, they estimate. It cost tens of billions at the time. They kept it secret for five years from the public, and there was over 50,000 people closely associated with it. Well, they've kept this quasi-secret, and then all they do is ridicule people when they talk about it. When the TPP was being set up to hand over our sovereignty uh, and merge the North American Union with the Asian Union, I began to cover it. And they would have national media say that we were making it up and we're insane. When we covered other UN treaties, like the Rio de Janeiro uh, Agenda 21 from 1992, they would say it's insane, doesn't exist, even though we have the public documents. Now they admit, though, yeah, these treaties do put us under international corporate control. They will make the rules about what happens in the U.S. Monsanto now goes to the World Trade Organization to stop labeling in the U.S. You see, they go outside to these other bodies where our national sovereignty has been transferred to. We need to have a serious discussion, a bipartisan, across-the-board discussion about weather modification. Listen. They still say the SR-71, in service in the mid-50s, is the fastest plane in the world, flying upwards of Mach 5. Ladies and gentlemen, they've got aircraft that have been classified that are much, much faster. And that just shows you how we're in this frozen technological development system that the Bilderberg Group wants of negative growth. They want to freeze us in a dark age while the elites have access to these technological reservations and life extension technologies and that they get to basically ascend. So they're stealing our culture, our civilization, our brain trust. Exactly what Eisenhower warned us about, a technological elite in control of the military industrial complex taking over. An opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. And that's because we now know that L.L. Lemnister, the Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman, and others came to him basically with the larger globalist plan to be part of it, and Eisenhower rebuked it and said it was horrible. Well, unfortunately, this group has gone from being prominent through the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations and actually funding Hitler 
because the U.S. wouldn't fully adopt it. Hitler then failed, and that plan has come back here to the United States. It's very, very sophisticated, but if you're aware of it, it can be beat. But it's all about covert. We bring it out in the light. They said Bilderberg Group didn't exist. Now they admit it exists. On so many things, they want to just end debate by saying it isn't happening. But if you just research it, don't Google chemtrails, because that's just what the lay term. You look at weather modification, geoengineering, uh, basically terraforming here on the planet, you'll get thousands of university reports, Department of Energy programs. It's going on. It's going on big time. And they even put it in kids' textbooks now to condition them and admit it's happening, but tell them it's good. To adults, they go, no, it doesn't exist. This is how they condescend to us. So am I worried about carbon dioxide? Absolutely not. Am I worried about uh, geoengineering and genetic engineering and all these other crazy super science, science fiction stuff? You bet I am. Well, great job to David Knight and the rest of the crew this evening. Uh, that's it for this transmission. I hope you'll get this video and the other important pieces tonight that we post to InfoWars.com tomorrow and get it out to your friends and family and go research the claims I've made here for yourself because it all comes down to you. If you don't stand up to this, we will be completely enslaved. All right, that's it. Have a great evening.